love fly fishing. I think it's the greatest, most exciting way to catch fish. Any size, anywhere. And I think anyone can do it if they take care to buy the right equipment and they practice with it. Hi, I'm Bob Gard. With this program, I'm going to show you the quickest, fastest way to learn fly fishing so that you can derive the greatest amount of satisfaction from a fantastic sport. I'll show you how to select a balanced fly fishing outfit and then put it together. I'll get you started with a few basic casts. And then you'll join me as we go fly fishing for bluegills, fly fishing for trout, and fly fishing for largemouth bass. To get the most out of this tape, put that VCR of yours to work. Hit the pause button, use the rewind and replay. You know, this isn't just another one of those TV fishing shows. This is your ticket to the world of fly fishing. Having the right equipment is no guarantee that you'll catch fish, but it sure helps. The key to getting the right equipment is to make sure all the components are balanced. That means everything is designed to work together. The line and leader match the fly. And the rod and reel match the line. With a balanced system, it's easier for you to make accurate casts. That way you can catch more fish. And you'll have a lot more fun. Whoa! All right, nice fish, nice fish. Whoa, it's a brown trout, too. Nice brown. One of the easiest ways to get a balanced system is to buy a complete fishing outfit from a quality supplier. A typical outfit may include a rod, reel, line, leader, and backing. Everything you need except flies and some accessories. These outfits are an excellent value, and they're a great way to get started without worrying about a lot of equipment choices. Come on, fella, I'll let you go. Oh, what a pretty fish. Look at those red spots. Oh, pretty fish. Right in the side of the mouth here. Hello, guy. How you doing? Let me get this out of you. Nice brown trout. That's what having a balanced outfit's all about. Even if you get a complete outfit, you still should know about things like line weights, rod weights, leader sizes, and so on. Let's start with the line. In fly fishing, you cast the line, and the weight of the line carries the fly. You have to pick a line that matches the fly and the kind of conditions you're fishing in. To pick the right line, you need to choose a line weight, taper, function, and color. All of those features are identified on the fly line's label. This is the line's weight number. The weight number refers to how much the first 30 feet of line actually weighs. Fly lines come in weights 1 through 13, with 1 being the lightest and 13 the heaviest. Your first line should be a 6 or 7 weight. These are the best weights for learning to cast. If you're going after panfish, you'll have more fun on a 6 weight system than a 7. A 6 weight is also a good size for stream trout. But if you're going to do some bass fishing, go for the seven weight. A seven weight also has the power you need for longer casts in windy conditions, typical of large western trout streams. After picking a line weight, you need to choose a taper. Your first line should be a weight forward taper. On the label, that's abbreviated WF. When fish are feeding on or near the surface, you should use a floating fly line. It's the easiest line to use, and it's the one you'll be using most often. But many times fish are feeding at different levels below the surface, and a floating line might not get your fly deep enough. Then you should use a floating sinking line. The tip sinks, taking the fly down to the feeding level of the fish. The rest of the line floats, making it easier to pick up and cast. So your first fly line should be a six or seven weight forward floating line. Your second line should be a floating sinking line with a 10 foot fast sinking tip. 
the same weight as your floating line. And you want an extra spool and backing for that second line. Finally, what about line color? If you can see your line, it'll make both casting and fishing easier. So pick a bright line, like orange, yellow, or white. Once you've picked your line weight, it's easy to pick a rod. Just make sure it matches the line weight you've chosen. The label on a fly rod shows the weight of the line is designed to handle, like a six weight rod for a six weight line. Some rods are designed to handle two line weights, like a six seven weight rod. A six or seven weight fly rod should be between eight and nine feet long. With today's technology, graphite is definitely the best choice for a first rod. It gives you the most performance for your money. Pick a reel the same way you pick a rod. It should match your fly line. Most reels are designed to hold a specific range of lines plus backing. For example, a four, five, six reel or a seven, eight reel. There's one more part to a balanced system. That's the tapered leader with its tippet. This section of clear monofilament line makes the fly look like it's floating or swimming naturally. Like your fly line, the leader should be tapered from a thick butt section that ties onto the fly line down to a thin tippet that ties onto the fly. You can buy tapered leaders in a wide variety of sizes and lengths. The X number tells you the diameter of the tippet section. The higher the X number, the thinner the tippet. The smaller the fly, the thinner the tippet you should use. For trout, you'll frequently use flies in the 12 to 16 size range. The size number refers to how big the hook is. A 4X leader matches those flies. And for trout, you'll probably want to use a 9-foot leader. Panfish flies are usually bigger than trout flies, so a 3X leader works well with them. Panfish are not as leader shy as trout can be, so you need only a 7.5 foot leader. Bass flies are much bigger, and you'll need a thicker tippet to fight the fish out of the weeds. Use an OX leader 7.5 feet long. As you change flies, you cut off part of the tippet, and eventually you'll use it up. Rather than putting on a whole new leader, just tie on more tippet material. So when you buy leaders, also get some extra tippet material in the same X size. We've shown you how to pick the right fly fishing system. First, you decide what fish you're most likely to be fishing for, like panfish, trout, or bass. Then you pick a line and leader to match the kind of fishing you want to do. The rod and reel should match your choice of line. The result is a balanced fly fishing system that meets your needs and provides the greatest satisfaction and enjoyment. Now that you've got all the pieces, let's put them together. You may want to do this in front of your TV, pausing and rewinding the tape as we go along. First, let's set up the reel. Most reels come from the factory set up for right hand cranking. For anglers like Bob, that's fine. He prefers to cast with his right hand, his dominant hand. Then he switches the rod over so he can also crank the reel with his right hand. Many other anglers like to cast with their dominant hand and crank the reel with the other. That way they don't have to switch hands. At 3M Scientific Anglers, we highly recommend learning to cast this way. But you should do whatever feels comfortable to you. To switch the reel to left hand cranking, you'll have to change the internal drag. Each brand's a little different, so follow the instructions that come with the reel. After you've set up the reel the way you want it, slip it onto the reel seat on the rod. Make sure you have the reel handle on the side that you want to crank. Then tighten it firmly, but not too tight. You'll want to take the reel off for storage or travel. This is how the reel will look after you fill it with line and backing. Fill it with enough backing so that the line comes up to within a quarter inch of the rim of the spool. Now here's how you put on the backing. You should have a 100-yard spool of 20-pound test Dacron backing. It'll be easier to tie the backing on the spool if you take it out of the reel first. Thread the backing through the stripping guide. That's the guide closest to the reel. Then thread the backing through the reel. Watch where you thread the backing through. Wrap the backing around the spool the same way it will wind on when you crank the reel. To secure it, tie one overhand knot in the tag end of the backing. Tie another overhand knot around the backing that goes to the stripping guide. 
pull the tag end knot tight first. Then tighten the other knot. Give the backing a firm, smooth pull to snug the knot against the arbor or axle of the spool. Then put the spool back on the reel. Make sure you don't get the backing caught in the reel when you put the spool on. Use your thumb and finger to keep some tension on the backing as you wind it on. Move it back and forth so the backing winds on in even layers. You can put the spool of backing on an unsharpened pencil held between your knees. The instructions that come with your reel should tell you how much backing to put on. In many cases, you'll be able to use the whole 100-yard spool. Now when you wind on the fly line, make sure you tie the end labeled this end to reel to the backing. If you get a weight forward line turned around, you simply won't be able to cast it. Thread the line through the stripping guide. If your line comes in loose coils, put it over a rolled up magazine or newspaper. That will keep the line from tangling as you wind it on the reel. Now for your first reel fly fishing knot, the nail knot for tying the backing to your fly line. You'll need a small tube to tie this knot. You could cut off about an inch of the ink tube in a ballpoint pen. Even a little swizzle stick will work. We're going to use a rope kit so you can see how to tie this knot. The blue rope is the fly line and the white rope is the backing. Hold the tube and the backing about an inch from the end of the fly line. Leave yourself a tag end of about six to eight inches of backing to work with. Take the tag end of the backing and wrap it around the fly line the tube and the backing that goes to the reel. Wrap it snugly and keep it tight with your thumb and forefinger. Wrap it around five times from left to right, keeping the wraps snug and even. Don't put the wraps over each other. Then put the tag into the backing through the tube. And with your thumb and forefinger pinching the wraps, carefully pull out the tube. Then alternately pull in the tag into the backing and the backing that goes to the reel. That will tighten up the knot. Test the knot by pulling firmly on the backing and the fly line. Trim off the tag ends as close as you can. That'll let the knot slip cleanly through the guides. This is what your finished nail knot should look like. As you wind the fly line onto the reel, make sure the line comes off its holder the same way it winds onto the reel. That keeps the line from getting twisted. Pinch the line to keep some pressure on it and move the line back and forth to wind it on in even layers. Now you can tie on the leader. Use the same nail knot you used to tie the line to the backing. Remember, the thick butt section of the leader ties onto the line. Wrap the butt section of the leader around the tube and the fly line. Then put it through the tube and tighten the knot. Your finished knot should look like this. Your tapered leader already has a tippet section, so you don't have to add more now. But once you've changed flies a few times and cut off most of your tippet, you'll want to add more. You do that with a surgeon's knot. Take a 24 to 30 inch piece of tippet and overlap about six inches of it with the leader. Make a loop with the two pieces and pinch it together with your fingers. Bring the tippet and leader back through the loop just like tying an overhand knot. Then bring them back through the loop again. Make sure the loops are equal in size. Then, pull the leader and tippet on either side of the knot to tighten it. Trim the tag ends, and you've got a surgeon's knot. Before tightening the surgeon's knot, you should wet it to reduce friction. Friction causes heat, which weakens the line and causes the knot to break. You should wet all monofilament knots. While we're on the subject of tying knots, we'll show you the improved clinch knot for tying your fly to your tippet. Thread about three to four inches of tippet through the eye of the hook. As you get better with this knot, try to use less and less tippet. That'll make the tippet on your leader last longer. Wrap the tag end around the tippet five times. Put the tag end back through the loop next to the hook eye, but not through the hook eye itself. Then, thread the tag in through the bigger loop you've just made. Hold the tag in stationary over the back of the fly, then pull in the tippet to tighten the knot. Again, wet the knot before you pull it tight. Trim the tag end as close as you can. This is the knot you'll use most often while fishing. Learn to tie it well, 
because there's nothing as frustrating as losing a good fish to a bad knot. Now let's put the rod sections together. Slide the tip ferrule over the butt section with the guides offset. Then, keeping your hands close to the ferrules, twist the sections together firmly until the guides line up. To string up the rod, strip the leader and about 10 feet of line from the reel. That's holding your fly. Put the butt of the rod on the ground, but don't let dirt or sand get in your reel. If you double the line over when you thread it, the line can't fall back through the guides if you let go. Make sure you go through each guide and don't wrap the line around the rod. Now pull the leader and tip it out and tie on a fly. Now that you've put your system together, let's go practice some fly casting. To practice fly casting, you'll need an open area about 80 feet long by wide. A smooth cut lawn at a school or park makes a good practice field. For practicing, you should have a seven and a half foot leader on your line with a bright piece of yarn tied on for a practice fly. Wear sunglasses to protect your eyes when you're casting, even when you're practicing with a yarn fly. Before we get into casting, there's one basic term you should know, and the line takes as you make a cast. A well-formed loop looks like a candy cane and is usually about two to four feet wide. To get a well-formed loop and make a good cast, you have to learn the basic cast stroke. Don't try casting the line right away. Use just the butt of the rod and concentrate on the hand and arm movements. Point your thumb toward the tip and grip it firmly. Now here's the basic casting motion for getting a good loop. It's the foundation for all the casting techniques you'll learn later. Let's take a closer look at each part of this movement. Start with your arm forward, about shoulder high. Your hand and wrist should be rotated forward. Draw your arm straight back, parallel to the ground. Your hand and wrist start rotating back slowly. It's a slow motion. You don't apply any power to the cast here. When your hand is a few inches from your shoulder, you smoothly but quickly rotate your hand and wrist back. This is where you... At the end of the casting motion, you let your hand and wrist drift back a little. Then drive your arm straight ahead, parallel to the ground. Wrist drift forward. Use a quick, smooth wrist action to power the cast. Then let your hand and wrist drift forward. As you're practicing, concentrate on making a quick, smooth wrist motion. But don't exaggerate it. It's a tight, controlled movement over a fairly small angle. Now let's see the basic casting stroke from the opposite side. Imagine you're standing next to a big clock. As you begin moving your arm back, the rod drifts up to the 11 o'clock position. Then you apply the power with that slight wrist motion, quickly and smoothly flipping the rod back to 1 o'clock. As you finish, then push it any further. Cast, but you re review it becomes learning how to actually make enough line. more right now. the time. Get a 45 when you hold the lot, wait, out of wait, and from hitting straight out slowly. Then you back to one drift down a forward to Turn your head as you make the back cast and watch the line. The line should form a loop and then lay out straight behind you. In this demonstration, Bob's been pausing briefly at the end of his power stroke. That shows you where the power ends and the drift begins. He's also been using a long, exaggerated arm movement that shows each element of the basic casting motion. As you become a caster, you'll develop a smooth, continuous casting motion like the one Bob is demonstrating now. You'll also learn to shorten or lengthen your arm movement to match the length of line you're casting. Practice a front cast and a back cast separately, stopping between each one. Work at it until you can get the line to go out straight in both directions. Then, back cast, front cast. This is called the pick up and lay down cast, and it's one of the casts. The key to making this cast is waiting for the back cast to straighten out before front cast. Also, notice that Bob doesn't let the rod drift down very far after his power stroke. Now you want to keep that back cast up in the air. Stop the power at 11 and let the rod drift down with a line. That's how you make an accurate, delicate cast. 
When you make continuous front and back cast, you're false casting. The basic casting motion, except now you keep the rod from drifting down on both the front and the back cast. You want to keep those loops up. You can use false casting to dry off your fly or change the direction of your cast. Watch how Bob changes direction a few degrees at a time. And then he makes his cast. When you're able to make a good front cast, the next step is to try shooting line. Shooting lets you cast further. Then you can cover more water and put the fly in front of more fish. For shooting, you need to have a few extra yards of slack line between the reel and the stripping guide. The energy of the cast will carry the extra line out through the guides. False cast and then make a regular front cast. Stop the rod at the 11 o'clock position and let go of the line. Make an O with your fingers to guide the slack line as it shoots. You can shoot any fly line, but the weight forward taper is best for shooting. When you learn the basic casting motion, you're ready to go out and try a little fly fishing. But there's one more skill you need to become a good fly caster. We'll show you how to identify and correct the most common problems that beginners face. For example, if you just can't get any distance with your cast, you may be casting too wide of a loop. A wide loop is caused by moving your rod in a big arc. A wide loop is air resistant and doesn't go very far. You may be using too much wrist motion. Correct the problem by moving the rod in a smaller arc. Control your wrist and power the rod only between 11 and 1 on the clock. Then you'll get tight, well-formed loops. Sometimes your line will get all tangled up when you cast. You'll even tie knots in your leader, commonly known as wind knots. But they're not caused by the wind. They're the result of a tailing loop. You get tailing loops when you punch the rod too quickly. Correct the problem with a basic casting motion. Apply smooth, even power to the rod between 11 and 1. Don't punch it. Move the rod tip far enough so you can accelerate it smoothly. Here's a problem everyone has at one time or another, driving the rod tip down when you make your final cast or delivery cast. Even if you have a good false cast going, driving the rod tip down ruins your loop and the cast. So when you make your delivery cast, don't change your casting stroke. Stop the power and let the rod drift down with a line. We've shown you some basic casting techniques to get the fly out to the fish, but your retrieve is just as important. After the cast, always put the line under your first or second finger. It gives you control of the line as you strip it in. To set the hook on a fish, just grip the line with that finger and bring the rod up in a smooth motion. Remember, get that line under your finger as soon as you can after the cast. It should become second nature to you, an automatic part of your cast. Sometimes, you don't have room for a back cast. Then, you'll have to use the roll cast. You can't really practice a roll cast on grass. You need friction between water and the fly line to make it work. To make the roll cast, bring the rod tip up until it's just behind your head. Tilt the rod out and away from you a little. Wait until the line stops moving towards you. Then quickly flip the rod tip forward and down. The line will roll out and flip the fly forward. Let's take a close look at the roll cast. Bring the rod tip up and behind you. Move the rod to the vertical position. You're not really applying power now. Here's where you apply the power. Use the force of your arm and your wrist to punch the rod out to about the 2 o'clock angle in front of you. Don't power it down any lower than that. Just let the rod drift down with the line. When you get the feel of the roll cast, it'll look like one continuous stroke. I've shown you some of the basic casting skills you'll need for fly fishing. To improve those skills, you'll want to take a class in a small group from a good instructor. That way you can get personal advice on what you're doing right and where you need to improve. For an in-depth video course on fly casting, get the Scientific Anglers Program's Basic Fly Casting and Advanced Fly Casting with Doug Swisher. You'll see that fly casting is a lifetime sport, 
and that there are always ways to improve your skills or add to your repertoire of cast. Bluegills are one of the most available and enjoyable fish you can catch on a fly rod. But to catch bluegills or any kind of fish, you need to understand the basics. Let Bob Guard get you off to a good start with a formula for successful fishing. It's often said that 10% of the anglers catch 90% of the fish. Basically, that's true, because most people don't know the formula for successful fishing. It's really not that complicated. One, you've got to find locations where fish live and feed. Two, you need to understand fish behavior, especially what to eat and how to eat. And three, you must be able to make the right presentation to catch fish. That includes selecting the right fly and making a cast that gets the fly to where the fish are feeding. Location plus behavior plus presentation. It's a proven formula you can use to catch any kind of fish. Let's use it and go fly fishing for bluegills. To catch bluegills, look for a location like this. Shallow water, about 10 feet deep or less, with lots of plant growth, like those lily pads out there. Or weed beds like this, with plants growing up to the surface. Weed beds with pockets of open water next to them are great. That's because you'll often catch fish on the edges between cover and open water. Bluegills use shallow, weedy locations like this because they can find plenty of food and cover here. Bluegills feed on aquatic insects like both the adults and the nymphs. They also eat terrestrial insects that fall in or blow in from the shore. And bigger bluegills will eat smaller fish like minnows and even their own fry. Bluegills use weeds as cover to hide from bigger fish that feed on them. But weeds aren't the only kind of cover they use. Cover can also be the shade created by a dock on a sunny day. Or it can be the branches of a tree that's fallen in the water. Or a brushy shoreline. But when bluegills spawn, adults come into very shallow water to build their nests. Bluegills usually spawn in the spring. The heat of the sun hatches. After you've picked a good location, think about how the bluegills are behaving. And when you're fly fishing, the behavior you're most interested in is their feeding level. When bluegills are feeding actively, they'll often take food floating on the surface. At other times, they may be feeding just below the surface. But they won't strike at something floating on the top. Sometimes, weather conditions will force the fish deep into cover. They may strike if you can put a slow-moving fly right in front of them, but it's a tough fishing situation. Your fly has to get to the feeding level of the fish, so you should have a variety of floating and sinking flies. These flies imitate the kinds of things that bluegills eat. These small poppers float on the surface, and these water crickets absorb water so they'll sink slowly. Bluegills will also take trout flies, a floating dry fly like a royal wolf, and small nymphs that sink below the surface. Now the big question is, which fly should you use first? Right now, there aren't any fish feeding on the surface, but they might be active enough to take a floating fly if they see one. I like to start fishing with surface flies like this popper. It's the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to find out if there are any active fish in this location. I'm using a six weight system with a weight forward line. The leader is seven and a half feet long, tapered to three X. I'm tying on the fly with an improved clinch knot. Use pliers to pinch down the barb of the hook. Do it carefully so you don't bend the hook itself or break the point. With the barb off, it's easier to get the hook out and release the fish unharmed. For sunglasses, to protect your eyes while casting, a good pair of polarized sunglasses takes the glare off the water and helps you see fish. The fish will go for that popper. Here's how you get started. Strip about 30 feet of line off the reel. Then move the rod tip back and forth just above the water, feeding the line out with your hand. Make a roll cast to straighten the line. Then a pick up and lay down cast. Don't just cast randomly. Concentrate and pick a target. You may not always hit it, but that's the way to improve your casting skills. 
In a situation like this, where you have an area of cover next to open water, try to put your fly right next to or just inside the cover. That's where the fish are probably feeding. As you can see from this angle, there's another weed bed just outside the lily pads. That kind of cover can hold bluegills too, so you want to retrieve your fly over it. After you make the cast, put the rod tip right down near the water. If you have the rod tip up, the line will move and pull your fly out of position. Then, take in the slack line. Remember, keep the line over your finger so you can set the hook if a fish strikes. To retrieve the fly, let it sit until the ripples have gone away. Then, strip the line in a few inches at a time. That action may get a fish's attention and provoke a strike. Strip the line and pause. Strip and pause. Vary the speed and timing of your retrieve. Sometimes a fast retrieve catches fish, sometimes it takes a slow retrieve. After you've retrieved the fly a few feet away from the cover, make a cast to another target. You want to cover the water. In this case, that means putting a cast every foot or so along the edge of the lily pads. You're using the fly to search for active fish. Keep on casting until you've covered the entire target area. Notice that Bob didn't jerk his rod up to set the hook. All it takes is a smooth lifting motion, just like you'd make to begin another cast. Keep the rod tip up. That helps keep pressure on the fish so the hook doesn't come out. Before you land the fish, get your hand wet. That way you won't hurt the fish's protective coat of slime. Watch out for the bluegill spiny dorsal fin. To avoid getting spiked, push the fin down and grasp the fish gently. Take the hook out as quickly as you can and put the fish back in the water. Rest him up a little and he'll swim away under his own power. Now that's fun on a light fly rod. That fish really attacked the surface hopper. But what if he hadn't? What if I'd covered this entire location and didn't get it? Should you change locations and move to another spot? First, you should try a different shape will provoke us. You may need to use a smaller surface fly, like one of these trout flies. But also behavior factor. If you're not getting any action on the surface, the fish may be feeding at a different level, below the surface. To search for those fish, use a Let's try a sinking fly on the water at the other end of the fly. heavier than a different. Slow your after the flackens. Again, strip, then strip. Now watch how the speed turns. Three by slowly. Pumping, you don't really strike. Up using a faster retrieve really gives it a And look what the following is. Keep it. Like instead of just a but under other can be triggered by a fat. Why you always try till you find out what this sinking with a fish made the fish this fly for fish and didn't get us again. You might change from a floating line to a wet tie at a deeper feeding level. A nymph would be a good pattern to use with that wet tip line. Or maybe time to try a different location. Look for a different kind of cover than your first location. For example, a spot that has more shade, more brush, or deeper water. Or you might just have to wait. When fishing slows down in the middle of the day, it often picks up again in the evening or the next morning. The main thing to remember is, be flexible. If you're not catching fish, do something different. And when you make a change, think about your fo Think about location. Find a spot that has good cover for edges between cover and open water. Think about behavior. Start with a surface fly and then go deeper. And deeper until you find the feeding level of the fish. Think about presentation. If you aren't catching fish, change flies. Try a different size, shape, or color. Vary the speed and timing of your retrieve. Catching bluegills is a great way to learn the basics of fly fishing. And when you're able to consistently catch bluegills, you'll be ready to go after bigger and more challenging fish. Now let's use that formula for success. Location plus behavior plus presentation and go fly fishing for trout. 
In a stream, you'll find trout in very specific locations called lies. Lies are often created by obstructions in the water, like rocks or fallen trees. Trout hold in lies to get out of the current. The slow moving water in a lie lets the trout conserve its energy. Trout feed in lies because the fast water brings food to them like a conveyor belt. Can you find the lies in this part of the stream? There may be one or more trout holding and feeding in each one of these spots. As with bluegills, the trout's feeding level is its most important behavior. Sometimes they'll be taking insects off the surface. Like mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, and terrestrial insects like beetles. At other times, they'll be feeding at levels below the surface. They'll be feeding on nymphs, scuds, sculpins, and other aquatic creatures. To get started in trout fishing, you need only four different types of flies. The key is to pick good patterns and then have a range of sizes. The Adams is a dry fly that imitates floating insects. 10 to 16 is a good size range to have on hand. The woolly worm is fished beneath the surface. Get this pattern in a couple of colors, size 6 to 12. The hare's ear is a classic nymph pattern. It represents a variety of underwater insects. Have a range of sizes, 6 to 18. The muddler is one of the most popular streamer patterns for imitating minnows. You can also fish it dry to imitate a grasshopper. Get a selection from size 4 down to size 12. In trout fishing, there are two basic presentations you can make, either upstream or downstream. Bob will show you how and when to use them. To fish for trout, Bob is using a six weight system with a weight forward line, and he's using a nine foot 4X taper leader. When you're learning how to use a dry fly to catch trout, you should start with the upstream presentation. That's because it's the easiest way to get a drag free float. This is drag it occurs when the fly doesn't float along with the current. Trout will usually reject a dragging fly because it doesn't look natural. When you cast upstream, your fly and fly line all float back to you at the same speed, so the fly doesn't drag. It floats naturally, so the trout are more likely to strike. Here's how to make that upstream presentation with an Adams dry fly. First, always treat your dry flies with floating. That helps them to float high on the surface like a natural insect. Then pick an area that has plenty of lies for trout and wade in downstream from there. Step carefully as you wade out. Felt sole boots will help you keep your footing. Neoprene waders will keep you comfortable, even in cold spring water. Then make short casts upstream, 30 feet or less. You don't want a lot of line floating around to put drag on your fly. Try to put the fly upstream from where you think a fish is holding. That will let the fly float down to the trout. You'll have to strip line in as fast as the current carries it back to you. Then shoot the line out on your next cast. You want as little slack line as possible between the fly and the rod tip. That lets you set the hook quickly when a trout strikes. When you've put a few casts through all the areas you can reach comfortably, take one or two steps forward and do it again. Now you're covering new lies that you didn't reach before. If the trout aren't hitting dry flies, put on a strike indicator and fish upstream with a nymph. This strike indicator is a short, hollow piece of floating fly line. It slides on over your tippet before you tie on the fly. To make the strike indicator stay in place, slide it over a knot in your leader. You should have about three to four feet of tippet between the fly and the indicator, or about twice the depth of the water you're fishing. You make the same kind of cast you made with the dry fly, casting upstream to areas like this riffle. The riffle is created by boulders on a stream bottom, obstructions that create lies for trout. Strip in the line as it floats back to you. Watch the indicator. Any hesitation or sideways movement means that a trout may have taken them, and you should set the hook. Most of the time, the trout's food floats or drifts with the current. The upstream presentation lets you present a fly in a similar manner. But sometimes the trout's food doesn't just drift, like this sculpin swimming along the bottom.
To imitate minnows and other swimming creatures that trout eat, make your presentations downstream. You can use the downstream presentation with wet flies, like the muddler or woolly worm. Let's start with a woolly worm. Simply cast across stream and let the fly and line drift downstream. Follow the line with the rod tip until it is straight downstream from you. Then take one step downstream and cast again. The downstream presentation is great for covering broad sections of a stream. You don't have to retrieve the line, just let it drift. Or you can add a little motion with the rod tip. If you're using a muddler minnow, that motion makes the fly dart around like a real minnow. We've covered this part of the stream pretty well. Let's try a dry fly again in a different section. That under bank is a great lie. The current next to the bank is slow. The faster water brings in food, and the undercut gives trout overhead protection from predators. Set the hook with a quick, smooth movement. Then put the rod tip up high to keep pressure on the fish. Look at him jump! It's a rainbow! Putting the rod tip down keeps the leader out of the brush or branches. You don't want to get hung up now. When you get him away from the bank, keep the rod tip up. Get the line on a reel so it doesn't get tangled. Keep steady pressure on him until he gets tired. Don't try to pull the fish in too fast or he'll break the tippet. To land the trout, put your rod up high and work the fish upstream from you. Get your hand wet so you don't hurt the fish. And wait until he settles down so you can land him. Just grasp him gently. Get the hook out as quick as you can. Taking that barb off the hook really makes this easier. Then hold the fish facing upstream. Don't let him go until he's recovered enough to swim away under his own power. We've just touched on some of the basics of fly fishing for trout. It's enough to get you started, but when you're ready for more in-depth information, take a look at the Scientific Angler's Mastery Series of video programs. You'll learn more about finding the best lies and making the right presentations to catch even the most selective trout. Quiet farm ponds like this can offer some great bass fishing, especially on a fly rod. Let's see how we'd apply our formula for success. Bass use many of the same kinds of locations as bluegills and other sunfish. In fact, the largemouth bass is a species of sunfish. Look for bass in shallow water. 10 feet deep or less. Water that has a lot of plant growth. Bass are structure-oriented fish, which means you'll usually find them next to objects in the water, like weeds, logs, branches, rocks, and docks. Bass use this kind of cover as a hiding place from which they can ambush their food. Bass eat large insects. They prey on other fish like bluegills and minnows. Basically, a bass will eat anything it can get in its mouth including frogs, snakes, mice, even small birds. To catch bass consistently, you have to understand how they identify and select their food. That's an important part of their behavior. Bass are predominantly sight feeders. They identify prey by how it moves in the water. A bass often waits until it can see something that moves like it's crippled or trying to get away. Then it strikes. Bass feed on the surface and at different levels below the surface. So you need both floating and sinking flies. But you also have to pay a lot of attention as to how you retrieve the fly. You have to make the fly look like something the bass would want to ambush and eat. Let Bob show you how to do it. To fish for bass, I'm using a seven weight system with a weight forward line. That's heavy enough to handle all but the biggest bass flies. My leader is seven and a half feet long, tapered to OX. That's equivalent to about 10 pound test. This is a typical floating bass fly a deer hair popper. The monofilament loop is a key feature of a good bass fly. A weed guard. It keeps the hook from getting caught in weeds and branches. That's important because to catch bass, you've got to get your fly right into cover. That's where bass live. I'm going to fish with another bass fly, a hard-bodied popper. The curved lip makes a big plopping splash when you retrieve it, 
and the rubber legs give it a lifelike action. Those are features that provoke strikes. This is a good bass location. The water is shallow and there's lots of weeds. Concentrate your fishing along edges, like that edge between the lily pads and open water. That's one of the most likely places where a bass will ambush its prey. When you cast a big air resistant fly, you've got to slow down your pace a little. Turn around and make sure the back cast straightens out before you start the front cast. After you make the cast, put your rod tip down near the water. Point the rod straight at the fly and take in the slack line. Keep the line under your finger. Now you're ready to set the hook quickly. Let's work on the retrieve. That's the most important part of your presentation to a bass. The first thing you can try is just letting the fly sit. And sit. Be ready to set the hook because a bass could come up and just blow that bug right out of the water. Then give it a little pop and let it sit some more. Don't move the rod, strip the line to move the fly. Keep the rod tip down, pointed at the fly, so you're ready to set the hook any time. You're trying to make the fly look like something that's wounded or crippled. An easy meal for Mr. Bass. I call this the mill and mouse retrieve. It looks like a mouse or small animal swimming. To the bass, it might look like a meal trying to get away. Don't use the same retrieve over and over. Try long strips, then short strips. You're trying to find out what the bass wants. Hold your rod tip up to put pressure on the fish. That keeps the hook in the bass's mouth and helps you get the fish out of the weeds. A hooked bass heads for cover. You probably won't have time to get the line on the reel, so just keep stripping, pulling right in over the weeds if you have to. It's a lot of fun to catch bass with surface flies, but bass often feed at levels below the surface. To reach those fish, you need to use sinking flies, like this rabbit fur fly. Look at that action. By varying the speed and timing of your retrieve, you can make it swim through the water. Or crawl along the bottom. It has a weed guard so you can retrieve it through thick cover. If you don't want to go deeper than three or four feet, fish a sinking fly with your floating line at seven and a half foot leader. But if you want to fish deeper, and especially if you want to crawl that fly along the bottom, use your wet tip line. You don't need a long leader on a wet tip. Use the nail knot to tie a three-foot piece of heavy tipping material to the end of the fly line. OX is heavy enough for light cover. The sinking part of your wet tip line pulls the fly down to deeper feeding levels. Even as you strip line to retrieve, the fly stays deep. Because the tip sinks, you may have to make a couple of roll casts to get the line and fly up to the surface. Then you can make a regular straight line cast. Once you've experienced the excitement of hooking and landing a fish on a fly rod, you'll want to learn more and more about this sport. And you want to improve your skills. The question is, where do you go from here? Fly fishing magazines are a great source of information. You'll learn more about tactics and techniques. You'll learn about different lines, tapers, and tippets. You'll go along on fly fishing adventures around the world. You might sign up for a fly fishing class or clinic. It's a fun way to find out more about the sport. By watching this program several times and really studying it, you're going to get the basics you need. 
then you'll be ready to experience the pride that comes with a well-placed cast. The satisfaction knowing what the fish are doing and why. And the thrill of a fish striking and bending your rod to the water. You're ready to experience the magic of fly fishing. excitement you're after, come fishing with the experts from 3M Scientific Anglers and learn ways to catch more and bigger trout on the fly. You'll learn where to find trout in a stream and ways to present the right fly with the perfect cast so you can catch the most elusive trout during hatch and non-hatch situations. Plus there's steelheading for 20 pound rainbows or going for the ultimate saltwater challenge. Let 3M Scientific Anglers bring home the excitement while you learn a lifetime of mastery techniques that will help you become the best fly fisherman you can be.
I love fly fishing. I think it's the greatest, most exciting way to catch fish. Any size, anywhere. And I think anyone can do it if they take care to buy the right equipment and then practice with it. Hi, I'm Bob Gard. With this program, I'm going to show you the quickest, fastest way to learn fly fishing so that you can derive the greatest amount of satisfaction from a fantastic sport.